Lucasfilm. Way before Lucasfilm threw their hat into the animation game with Star Wars The Clone Wars and Strange Magic, yeah, remember Strange Magic? They first dipped their toes into the medium way back in the early 80s, being involved in an animated film called Twice Upon a Time. George Lucas was the executive producer of this comic fantasy film, made with an animation style called Lumage, a combination of the words luminous and image. Despite the name recognition of Lucas and this unique animation style, the film was a major flop, and despite some cable presence on Showtime, Disney Channel, and Cartoon Network throughout the 80s and 90s, the film has been largely forgotten, even more so than Strange Magic. This is a story of three years of production, two documentarians, and one awful year to be an animated film. Let's go back to Twice Upon a Time. The seeds of this film lay with a man named John Cordy. Back in his 11th grade art class, his teacher showed the work of Canadian animator Norman McLaren, and it was there that Cordy became interested in animation. But that's not the main route his career would take him. He would have a wildly prolific filmmaking career, directing documentaries, narrative TV films, and serving as director of photography for a Robert Redford film called The Candidate. But Cordy was still passionate about animation, opening his own animation studio in Antioch College with four students and doing contractual work for commercials and networks. One of his animated shorts after college was nominated for an Oscar for Best Short Documentary, an anti-smoking film called Breaking the Habit. This short and all of his other animated work was made with a cutout animation style he called Lumage. Lumage consists of cutout characters being made from synthetic fabric called Pelon and dyed with watercolors for hue changes. They are then moved on a light table frame by frame on backgrounds made of acetate, which makes the scenery translucent and gives the characters a glowing stained glass look. While cutout animation was nothing new, Cordy created the specific Lumage technique after being inspired by a book of Matisse cutouts given to him. He liked that the cutouts were, quote, flat graphic designs and very graceful freeform cutout shapes, and had a, quote, quality different from the Disney cute, cuddly, curvy creatures. He also felt that the style of animation gave his projects a freer spirit, such as the hands not having to be attached to the bodies. That's not to say using cutouts over cell animation solved every problem. The colored brand of paper that was originally used would curl up under hot light, so its usage would have to be limited. Cordy also contributed dozens of short segments for programs produced by the Children's Television Workshop, namely The Electric Company and Sesame Street. P is also for parachute. P, P. Perhaps Cordy's best known work is Sesame Street's Thelma Thumb series. Zapper, Jeffy, Squincher, Scrum, make me During this time, he was also winning awards, an Emmy for the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman, and an Oscar for Who Are the DeBolts and Where Did They Get 19 Kids. While Cordy was directing documentaries in other films like the NBC TV film Farewell to Manzanar, he had his own animation crew working on the Thelma Thumb shorts, which he also directed. As someone who was making feature-length documentaries and animated shorts, it was inevitable for Cordy to want to develop a feature-length animated film. He conceived the idea to make one as far back as the early 70s, starting with the Charlie Chaplin-esque figure that eventually became Mumford, or Mum. The second character was this Chaplin-esque figure's sidekick, a talking partner that can morph into any animal, which became Ralph. Cordy then organized small partnerships to independently raise $150,000 to develop this animated feature. This money would go towards developing the screenplay, the money for creating the cutout characters and backgrounds, and most importantly, a 10-minute sample reel of animation to garner interest from studios. This sample reel contained experiments with multiplane animation too, a depth that the other Lumen shorts didn't have. Cordy promised these investors a film that would appeal to all age groups, a film about fantasy characters that interacted with the real world, and a film that could appeal to both children and adults. Oh boy. Cordy would later admit that this was an issue once the film needed to be marketed. The story of the final film is that dreams are made in frivoly and delivered by green sleeves and this figment of imagination, and nightmares are made in Merkworks and delivered in the forms of bombs by vultures to the people of Din. When the head of Merkworks, synonymous botch, wants the people of Din, called the Rushers of Din, to have non-stop nightmares, it's up to two characters from Frivoli to put an end to the plan, which they sort of helped put in place to begin with, hence why they need to prove themselves twice upon a time. In 1976, documentarian Bill Couture rejoined Cordy Films, and he would become the eventual producer of Twice. In 1979, the story, character development, and animation reel were all completed. The first person Cordy and Couture showed the sample reel to was none other than George Lucas, who was a friend of Cordy since the late 60s, and people say that connections don't matter. Lucas was a fan of the animation in the reel and immediately suggested taking it to Alan Ladd Jr. at the Ladd Company. For context, Alan Ladd Jr. was the one who greenlit the original Star Wars before leaving Fox and starting up the Warner Brothers finance studio, the Ladd Company, in 1979. So if anybody could make a deal happen, Lucas could. And he did. In one day. Ladd saw the film as a cheap one with Lucas's name attached, so what could go wrong? And, quite frankly, Lucas had little to do with the movie after that besides a script reading and a preview screening with his then-wife, Marsha. But it doesn't matter the extent of Lucas's involvement. In January 1980, they were given their budget of $2.3 million. It was originally budgeted at $5 million by Couture, but Lucasfilm didn't want to offer more than $2.5 million. And ironically, the budget that Twice would end up being was in fact $5 million. 
Production was scheduled to begin in July 1980 for a release in spring 1982. A deal was also struck with the Lad Company for Cordy to produce the film in his Mill Valley studio like all of his previous indie films, which was actually a three-story Victorian home. And that home was where 98% of the film would be shot. And though Cordy would obviously carry over as much of his Thelma Thumb animation crew as he could, including writer, animator, character, designer Brian Norell, and art director, character, designer Harley Jessup, Cordy knew that a bigger staff would be necessary for a feature film. There were about eight main animators at Cordy Films prior to Twice's production, and at Twice's peak, there were about 65 animators, and they all came from different animation walks of life. One of the new names that joined the crew was Henry Selleck, who left his job at Disney to work on the film, and make less money, because the footage he saw was mind-blowing. It was so much like the films that actually got him into animation. He joined Twice in fall 1981, and if the name Henry Selleck sounds familiar to you, you might know him as the director of The Nightmare Before Christmas, or Coraline. He would end up doing some animation background work, as well as directing the Nightmare Bomb sequence. Kai Pendel was also part of the crew, having come from the National Film Board of Canada shorts, where he directed the Oscar-nominated What on Earth? There was also Carol Milliken, who came on board from another animated film produced in the Bay Area called The Plague Dogs. She described this experience as the polar opposite of that film, and not for the reason you think. On Plague Dogs, animators would work typical 8-9 hour shifts, whereas on Twice, animators would work up to 100 hours per week. And then there's the 17-year-old David Fincher. That's right, future music video and film director David Fincher. This was his first film job, yet he knew about twice as Mitchell cameras better than anybody else due to his interest in cinematography, special effects, and opticals. He was originally hired just to move Xerox machines and load cameras, but because he was a tech and computer genius, he eventually worked his way up to being the film's effects supervisor, handling the special photographic effects. Fitting all of these animators into Cordy's three-story Victorian home, 200 Miller Avenue to be exact, was another problem. All of the floors of his rooms were turned into offices of pivotal crew members or rooms with animation desks, light tables, and cameras. The rooms for animators and cameras were all upstairs. The main art space was the third floor attic. It got so crowded at one point that there was also a 40-foot trailer in the back of the house accommodating more animators. The windows provided light, but the ceilings weren't high enough for the required multiplane camera setup. Camera 1 fit into the house's second floor master bedroom within only a half inch of the ceiling, and the walls were painted black. There were five camera rooms in total, and the first room with the camera one stand was called the monster stand because it cost a lot of money and had a wide canvas, as well as several layers to create a feeling of natural parallax during the big camera moves. Each animator usually focused on certain settings or sequences, such as Jessup being involved with Merc or Selleck's work being concentrated in Din. And there would usually be one animator for each character in a scene, moving things around with an X-Acto knife, and this leads to a lot of distinctly different styles and personalities being visually represented with the characters and atmosphere. But Cordy was not the only director. There was also co-director Charles Swenson. Swenson's work includes a dental hygiene movie segment within the Frank Zappa film 200 Motels. Does this kind of life look interesting to you? Night after night, dinners with Herb Cohen. Thrill pack, fun-filled evenings on the French Riviera at the Medem Convention. A baby tie, the whole bit. Watch Muddy and Leon feed the geese. Dirty Duck and the Mouse and His Child. He definitely had his hand in enough offbeat work to be considered a good fit as co-director for twice. He came on in late 1980 as a co-director and a co-writer. Swenson worked with the animators and became more involved with their work overall than Cordy, who would often take on other projects to direct and therefore leave production of Twice. One such work was the CBS TV film A Christmas Without Snow. Whenever Cordy was absent, Norell was the de facto head of Cordy Films as he was during the Thelma Thumb days. It should be noted that Cordy only took these projects to pay rent and salaries for his animators, just as he had before in those Thelma Thumb days. It was just different in these circumstances because the animators often felt lost without Cordy, who didn't put as much attention into their work like Swenson did. Though Cordy would view dailies, Cordy wouldn't be in the camera rooms like Swenson was. Swenson made sure to communicate with his artists, whereas Cordy was a lot more laissez-faire. Cordy himself admitted that Swenson, who had been in the LA animation business, kept the wheels going once Cordy got the film's vision and studio in motion. It's important to realize that so much of why Cordy directed the way that he did was because he came from a background that favored improvisational dialogue and spontaneous on-screen actions. Cordy noticed that the tight and controlled nature of animation made for a great juxtaposition with the spontaneous vibe of the dialogue. Cordy specifically sought out and cast improv comedians from groups like The Committee, which should be a surprise to no one since one of his films was literally about The Committee. The cast members would wear these special headsets with mics and be allowed to move around freely in the same room with each other, which gave the dialogue a conversational tone that Cordy wanted. Uncle Greeny, where are you? I'm under the door, you twit! Well, that's a pretty stupid place to be when people are knocking doors down. Let me open this for you. Cordy was inspired by the more free and experimental nature of John and Faith Hubley's animation, as well as the look and feel of Yellow Submarine. Lorenzo Music as Ralph was the one exception. Though he wasn't involved with improv necessarily, he was involved in comedy, known most notably as the voice of Carlton the Doorman in Rhoda. Yes? Uh, this is Carlton, your doorman. Yes, Carlton, what? I'm not accusing you of anything, but you were uh, just down in the laundry room. <laughs> Did 
you describe the article you're missing? Half empty. You got it. <laughs> An animated spin-off special called Carlton, Your Doorman, was directed by Charles Swenson, who brought music onto Twice to replace original voice actor Bud Court. Swenson, like Cordy, really clicked with the improv recording sessions too, though he still utilized storyboards and planning throughout production. But with so many comedians and a loose script, Twice is still more reminiscent of UPA than Disney or even Warner Brothers. With that said, this also made Twice's production process unusual, as it didn't follow a strict storyboard process like a majority of animated films do. So the flow of storyboard, Animatic, rough animation, cleaned up animation, finished shot, was not ever closely followed. The film was shot using complex animation stands. The main camera's light source would shoot up and shine through a sheet of translucent white plexiglass where the backgrounds would lay. There were wide panes that served as their multi-plane setup. Open the optical glass, move your cutouts, lower the planes, shoot a frame, and repeat. The plane system, with pan and tilting abilities, was controlled by one Apple II computer. In other words, these were layered, modular backgrounds with computer-controlled camera movements. But this was no easy task. If a light bulb burned out or a camera jammed, days or even weeks of animation would be lost. Also, according to scene animator David Pettigrew, it would often take up to 12 hours to even set up the shot, a process in which Jessup would create backgrounds on acetate with transparent paint, colored gel, and Pellon at his third floor desk, and then take him down to the camera room where he'd arrange them into a multi-layer set for animators to use. It was then up to the animators to get their character parts ready on trays. By the time Jessup was done, the heat from the lamps would already be buckling the backgrounds, so once the camera was ready, animators had to stay in that room until the shot was completed, and camera rooms were in high demand and on a schedule. Sequence director Carl Willett and Heidi Holman actually spent months planning for the death of Ibor shot, locking the doors and alternating between working and sleeping. The end result was a single continuous shot with LED lights under an open shutter serving as sparks, smoke airbrushed onto the glass frame by frame, and a real TV monitor between layers of animation, with its angle adjusted as Ibor spun. Willett's other big scene was Scuzzbop's great Amerkian novel being dropped out the window by Botch, in which every piece of paper had to be animated separately, moving left and right, twisting and turning individually. The animators were thrown all kinds of obstacles throughout the production, and always succeeded in overcoming them. One example is the challenge of creating flames for the Rod FGM interview scene. It became fully realized by animating the flames on black construction paper with cut-out flame shapes, and then matting them separately so backlit frames would be seen exposed. A shot with the Dream Rocket smoke was accomplished by utilizing out-of-focus poppy seeds on the glass. The crew also realized that their 3D camera space allowed for some unusual in-camera effects. For example, this small noose in the foreground is real rope being hung from the camera lens. The projector lens flare in the camera was accomplished by having a light bulb on a cord between animation layers. One of the most notable shots of the film occurs early on, where the camera flies under a 3D train trestle model and into the 2D multiplane background. The 15-foot long trestle was built in Jessup's apartment out of cardboard and painted black. Fincher operated the motion control camera. The din scenes in motion were shot on location throughout the Bay Area in two or three days, turning the camera down to different speeds to create a lower frame rate and then speed it back up to create the rusher environment. Black and white photographic transparencies were used for the still scenes for a more fractured look, which helps explain why the frozen world of Din looks collagey. The Din Nightmare sequence effects crew consisted of Henry Selick as director, along with Peter Crossman, Mark West, and David Fincher for $2,000. It was shot in five 20-hour days in a basement under a law firm on Miller Avenue. They used a fish tank to simulate a 3D rusher environment, which had to be both frontlit and backlit, and India ink served as the nightmare smoke because Cordy was fascinated by how the ink moved when dipped in water. This led to the tank having to be cleaned out often because ink made the water dirty. The actual setting with the rushers was created by high-res photos hot glued to plexiglass. The film consists of around 50,000 frames of animation. 24 frames per second at 70 minutes comes out to around 100,000 frames, but the film was animated on twos. Nevertheless, Gordy says that some of the trickiest bits of animation were less than 100 frames long, barely even a few seconds of screen time. The most complicated shot was this multi-pass shot where Flora is about to be run over by a train on the tracks inside the Markworks factory. In regards to attention to detail, the animators did their damnedest. Botch's teeth, for instance, were accomplished by cutting out the tiny transparencies on the film stock. The water coming out of the shower head was all individual cut-out pieces. The steam was another pass on some out-of-focus backlit stuff. This dedication to experimentation and impressive quality seen in the dailies, according to Swenson, created an environment of friendly competition to one-up each other in terms of out-of-the-box creativity. Animators would stay late at night, not by force but by choice, to create the best shots and overall film possible. But all these extra hours meant extra pay, which down the line might lead to budget problems. Cordy believed that Ladd would have pulled production on the film altogether if the film's budget went any higher due to overtime pay, so Cordy asked the animators to defer their overtime hours in exchange for double or triple the film's profits, with most of the crew agreeing to this, as they were still excited to be a part of the film that they thought would turn out great. The film's completion was also behind schedule, so the animators had to start hauling ass after 1981. Because they were the only studio doing Lumage cutout work, there was no other studio in the States or overseas that they could ask for additional help. A full rough cut was completed by May 1982, and that fall, the Ladd Company started holding sneak previews in California, one of which was in Westwood near UCLA. Naturally, the audience consisted of mainly college students, with many Ladd and Warner Brothers executives in attendance too. And what these execs saw was a lot of walkouts. 
and not just throughout, but primarily during the first 10 minutes. The scenes of the brightly colored cutesy frivolity made these college students assume that this was a film meant for little children. Because of the negative test screenings, the film was pushed back to spring 1983. And on top of that, Lad Company management told the crew shortly after that they would no longer be providing money for the production. The film would still be released, but they would not pay a dime for additional work necessary. Though the fault may fall on college students for not understanding the intentional cutesiness of Frivoli and not giving the film a chance, producer Couturi panicked. While Cordy was away directing a feature, Couturi added profanity into the dialogue sound mix using the voices of the original actors, without ever informing Cordy. I just want to say a few words to you minions before you go off on your mission. I know some of you have wives and sweethearts and all that malarkey. There's a good chance some of you won't be coming back. I can deal with that. I just want to say a few words to you scumbags before you deliver those nightmares. I know some of you have girlfriends and old ladies and all that kind of crap. And you're probably expected to get into their feathers tonight. Well, let me just say tough shit. The print of the film with Couturier's new mix was sent to the next showings during spring 1983, such as one screening in Seattle where it was paired as a double feature with The Secret of Nim. Background artists Heidi Holman, Willett, and Jessup personally attended another screening that spring in Oregon. Not only did they find that audiences weren't getting on the wavelength of the film's story and dialogue, but that they were also walking out in droves during the opening. Originally, it was college audiences walking out because of the lack of adult material, and now it was family audiences walking out because of the adult material. Not only were they failing at making a film for everybody, the crew was now struggling to make a film for anybody. To put it simply, Lad was mad. And by the spring of 1983, the Lad company was tens of millions of dollars in debt, with flop after flop after flop. To put it simply, Lad was doing bad. It seemed that Twice would never get a theatrical release. It's important to keep in mind that, regardless of a studio's failings in terms of output, 1983 was simply a dire year to be an animated film, let alone a child-friendly one. The 80s were an all-around bad era for animated fare, with the stigma that they were kids-only films. Animated flicks had such a bad rep during this time that even Disney was shying away from them, venturing off into live-action films and PG-rated fare. 1983 had no real notable animated releases aside of Fire and Ice, and even that was a flop. Regardless of the minor success films like Heavy Metal and The Secret of Nim received, titles and premises like these would do nothing to alter the perception of the animation medium being kid stuff amongst the public. One would think that with no animation competition, Twice would see solid profits, but Ladd was in no mood to invest money into Twice's marketing campaign, especially after the negative test screenings and their decision to market The Right Stuff instead. The Right Stuff was a three-hour-long historical drama which, while critically acclaimed, also flopped at the box office. And one would also think that Lucasfilm, which at that point in time was a production company with some prestige, would demand that a film with their name attached to it be given more of a chance. But as mentioned earlier, Lucas had little to no input in Twice's production after getting the film a distributor. It's not like he was going to suddenly step up to the plate and start doing promotion that the Lad Company and Cordy Films couldn't afford to do, especially since he was a little preoccupied with Lucasfilm's other 1983 release, which was coming out around the same time. It was quietly announced in July 1983 that Twice would finally get its theatrical run starting on August 5th in Westwood as a limited release. The film officially opened on that first Friday of August and was dropped after two weeks in theaters. According to AFI, Twice made only $4,000 during its first week and a mere $1,000 in its second. While a lack of marketing and unfamiliar animation style certainly didn't help the film's chances of being a hit, it also didn't help that Daffy Duck's movie Fantastic Island, another Warner Brothers distributed film, was released on the same day. That's right, Warner Brothers opened two of their animated films on the exact same day. It's no wonder that Couturi thinks that this was an intentional way to bury twice. Fincher said that he thinks Warner Brothers only committed to the two-week LA run because it was the bare minimum before it could be sold to premium channels. But regardless of how well Twice would or would not do on premium channels in the future, it went without saying that there would be no next film for Lumage Animation. And with that would also come the end of Cordy Films, at least at the 200 Miller Avenue residence. Since Cordy could not pay his staff their overtime hour wages, he instead repaid them in other ways. For example, Mark West was given a light table and an animation desk, and another animator was given Camera 3. The film aired briefly on HBO and Showtime, with HBO getting the Couturier theatrical version with the profanity, and Showtime being given Cordy's preferred clean version. The Cordy cut saw a VHS and Laserdisc release in 1991, and additionally aired on Disney Channel and Cartoon Network in the late 90s. But other than that, it never reached a significant cult following and essentially faded into complete obscurity. It wasn't until 2015 when it received both an airing on TCM and finally a release on DVD, with both the Cordy and Couturi cuts available. It's a real shame that Warner Brothers, Lucasfilm, and the general public didn't have much faith in this film because it's a truly ambitious mixture of 2D and 3D, with an incredibly creative and not to mention incredibly detailed atmosphere, 
a refreshingly inventive story, and some highly imaginative sequences. It's also very unique in its improv dialogue, similar to that of a Judd Apatow film or a mumblecore film before that was even a genre, where there are story beats that need to occur and lines that need to be said, but it doesn't matter how the actors get to that point. Mom, this still isn't working. I don't, I don't think we're cut out for this hero stuff. Then again, if Fairy Godmother knew we were stuck, she might... Oh, excuse me, is this... Is the Fairy Godmother in, please? FGM to you, speaking. Hi. Let me guess, you lost and can use a little help on my right. Right. Wow, how'd you guess? Oh, just lucky. Though the film isn't necessarily aimed at any particular demographic, I think there's something here that can be enjoyed by everybody. The characters are fun, the dialogue is clever, and the animation is experimental. There's an edge to its tone and improv humor that films like Shrek and Aladdin have similarly employed, and if one enjoys those films, I think they'll at least find something worthwhile here. Twice may not have the heart or structure of a Disney film, or even some of the DreamWorks films, but that doesn't make it any less good. It's a film totally absorbed in the zaniness of its own world. Sort of like Seinfeld's policy of having no hugging and no learning, this film doesn't try to tug at your heartstrings or have a serious message. It operates more along the lines of a Saturday morning cartoon, which is admirable. The cut-out animation is really charming in this film, giving it an identity that traditional cell animation might not have done. And I don't think the style of cut-out animation has died with Cordy and his Lumage creations. It reminds me of Eric Carle's work, so it's lived on in that regard. I think it has taken on new life digitally. Some would say with South Park, and while that may be the most predominant cut-out animation today, it personally reminds me a lot more of the animation in the original run of Blue's Clues. In the end credits of Twice, it was still photographer John Baker's idea of showing the whole cast and crew in a collage way similar to Frozen's Inn. This probably helped create a more personal feeling for the project, as not only was this crew able to see their work on screen, but also themselves. It's also cool for the viewer to notice just how youthful this crew was. The only other film I can think of that did something similar to this is A Boy Named Charlie Brown, by showing most of the crew members as their name popped up on screen, but even then, nowhere near to the extent that this film did their end credits, as Twice had them all in a giant collage. Oddly enough, despite the lackluster support from Lucasfilm in regards to Twice, several crew members would go on to work for Lucasfilm in one way or another, John Cordy ended up directing another Lucasfilm production, albeit a made-for-TV one, Caravan of Courage and Ewok Adventure. And then there's Fincher, who moved on to ILM's math department shortly after, and Jessup, who went to ILM as well, eventually winning an Oscar for visual effects work in the film Inner Space. Jessup also became a production designer for films like Monsters, Inc., Ratatouille, and Coco. Couture won an Oscar in 1989 for a documentary, Common Threads, Stories from the Quilt. I think Carl Willett said it best, Twice Upon a Time was graduate school, we worked ourselves to death for no money on a project that never saw the light of day, stayed up all night for two years, and met a bunch of really great people we'd work with again later in life. I learned everything about animation from working on this film. Without it, my life would not have been nearly as rich. Mr.